Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And once again, as always, on behalf of Mark, Alice, and myself, we want to greet you in the wonderful, the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As we continue on in our study of First Timothy, uh, we left off in the fifth chapter. We're going to be picking up, starting again, where we left off at verse 22, First Timothy 5, 22. And we're going to do that right after my sweet patootie, my darling wife, Alice, asks God's blessing on our time. Hallelujah. Father, we just praise you. We thank you. We bless you. And we love you. And we thank you for the time that you've given us to spend in your word. And we ask for understanding and knowledge. And we yes, ask God, nothing come out of Alan's mouth that you haven't put Amen. there. And just help us to continue to share the word with all that you put before us, all those you put before us. Amen. Amen. Well, as I said, we're continuing on. We're in the fifth chapter, down towards the end of the fifth chapter in First Timothy. And just if you're joining us for the first time, all of the prior studies are available online at our website, BibleTalk.com, in addition to a lot of other studies. So if you miss anything, you can go back there and watch them, okay? All right. 1 Timothy 5.22. And as I said, we, we read this at the end of last week. This is where we were, okay? But we didn't get a chance to get into it, so I want to do that now. Do not lay hands upon anyone too hastily and thereby share responsibility for the sins of others. Keep yourself free from sin. Don't lay hands on anybody too hastily. That's talking about making them, you know what, the word I talked about is, is ordination. Mm. But I think ordination is very poorly understood by and large in the church today. Because by and large, it seems that ordination is considered, well, the church is giving, empowering people to ministry, and that ministry typically being the fivefold ministry, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And I, I see that as not being correct, all right? The simple fact of the matter is every Christian, every believer filled with the Spirit of God has a ministry. Mm -hmm. That's very clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Yes. God works through each one individually as he wills. Ordination is not empowering somebody to do something. It is recognizing that God has called them to do something. Mm -hmm. and that's a very, very important distinction, okay? The word ordination means, and this is from the dictionary, to invest with ministerial or sacerdotal function, confer holy orders upon, to select for or appoint to an office. Hmm. Scratch, scratch. <laughs> right. uh, it's not those. What it is, is, now remember, first of all, that it says that a shepherd should know well the condition of his flock. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers, who are in the body are there to equip the saints for the work of service. And in the process of equipping the saints for the work of service, they should be nourishing that. They should be monitoring that, watching it. That's what you do. If you're, if you're raising a child, you, you take care of, you know, that, that growth, the pattern you watch for, right? Mm -hmm. So if a pastor is watching within his flock, how people are growing, what's going on in their lives spiritually, he should be, one of the first in the congregation to see what God is doing in their lives and what God is calling them to. Because like I said, God is calling each believer to some form of service in the body of Christ. So the ordination then becomes a recognition of, of God's hand on his call, right? So one of the things I, I just wanted to get into a little bit is how do you, how do you get equipped for the work of service. How do you get prepared for the work of service? How do you get prepared? You, you pre-pray. You, pre, you get pre-prayed. <laughs> yes, that's the word I like, pre-prayed. Well, I think by and large in the church today, people think that it's formal education prepares you for, for ministry. Mm. Okay, do you agree with that? That's what the church... Mm -hmm. that, that, that's the way the church typically sees it, mm -hmm. some kind of formal education. Remember that when Jesus went into the temple to teach, 
It says in John chapter 7, 15 through 17, the Jews there were astonished, saying, how has this man become learned, having never been educated? So Jesus answered them and said, my teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone is willing to do his will, he will know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak for myself. It's hearing what the Father says. It's absolutely hearing what the Father says and, and, and obeying, hearing and obeying, okay. Shema, okay? Well, they go hand in hand. You can't do one without the other. Absolutely. Okay. Um, I, I just want to talk about something. I have another premise to put forth, and that is that God, who is at work, both to work and to will his good pleasure in the lives of saints as he is growing them, cultivating them, okay. He's been calling them, preparing them. Can you get prepared for ministry before you are saved? I think so. I got a think so over yeah. here. Yes. I got two think so's. <clears throat> well, I think so. I, I think so. Uh, one of the reasons I say that is because I want you to know that if you're seeking God's purpose in your life, if you're trying to find God's ministry, God's call to ministry in your life, you, you need to recognize the fact, yes, you need to be trained. But the Holy Spirit was sent to lead you into all truth, right? Mm -hmm. You need to study, as Paul wrote to Timothy, study to show yourself approved unto God. You need to be in the Word, growing in the Word, okay? And listening to the voice of the Lord, spending time in prayer. And prayer is not you talking to God. Prayer is talking you with God, all right? And God will speak to you. But I can see in, in many lives, before that call happened, mm -hmm. how God had been preparing lives. Like David. Like Alice says, like David. Now, Paul. God, God called David to be the chief shepherd yes. of Israel. Mm -hmm. Okay? So when King Saul had been, God's, God spoke to Samuel and said, I'm gonna, he's out. So he sent him to the house of Jesse in Bethlehem to anoint. He said, I'm going to take you there to, to anoint the next king. Mm -hmm. So when Samuel went to Bethlehem, he goes to the house of Jesse, and Jesse starts bringing his sons, the, starting with the oldest. And as soon as Samuel sees the oldest son, who's tall, handsome, whatever, you know, he's, oh, this, this is the one. And God says, Mm -mm. I'm paraphrasing, by the way. God says, uh, uh, uh. No, no, no. No, no, no. He says, don't judge by his height or his cuteness. All right? Outward appearance. Don't judge by outward appearance because God doesn't judge by outward appearance. Mm -hmm. But God searches the heart. So they go through all of the sons. Mm -hmm. And when you get through all of the sons that are there, God hasn't spoken to Samuel. He hasn't said, now he already told Samuel that he's going to anoint the right. king there, right? Right. But there's not there. So he says, are, are there no more sons? And they said, well, there's David out tending his father's flock. They weren't even considering him. They weren't even considering him. No. But he comes, and that obviously is the one that God had his hand on. How was he prepared for ministry? Well, I'll tell you this. He was faithful in shepherding his father's flock. Yes. So he was prepared to faithfully shepherd his father's yes. flock. Amen. You said Paul. Well, well, Paul's a whole story here. Right? But how about Jesus himself? Mm -hmm. How about Jesus? He was a, he was the son of a carpenter. That's in that Jewish tradition, that typically they grew up in the family business. They were trained. They were apprenticed within the family business. So the father who was responsible, Joseph, the father of Jesus, was responsible, first of all, to be training him in the word. I mean, that's what it says in the first, the foremost command. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Okay, you're going to love him with all your heart, with all your mind, but you have to teach it to your children. Yes. So Joseph, while he was teaching Jesus about carpentry, would have been teaching him the word. Yes. What does a carpenter do? He builds and he molds and he shapes. Uh, he said, no, that's a, that's a, that's a pot. Wood. Okay. Wood. Wait, what a, but you you started out right, okay, before you went askew. <laughs> well, that's because I knew that's what Jesus is. He also works, he works with wood. He does. Alice started out right. A carpenter builds, 
and a carpenter repairs. Right, right, he repairs. I mean, okay, I'm, I'm probably 99% of the jobs the carpenters do, they're either building something or repairing yes. something. Jesus said, I'm going to build my church. Yes. He was a builder. From, from childhood, he had been trained about the principles of building, right? And they're natural, but trained. What about being repairing? That's exactly what Jesus was sent by the Father to do, to repair. Yeah. If, you, if you can picture that word in your mind, repair, put a hyphen between re and pair. Mm -hmm. Because yes. what Jesus came to do was to repair us with the Father. Let's connect us. Reconnect us with the Father. Yeah. Isn't that not right? So he was, I mean, this means Peter, Peter was a fisherman from a family of fishermen. Did, was that any preparation? He learned things there. He, he, mm. what, what did he learn? I'll tell you what. He must have learned something that Jesus saw because Jesus came to Peter and he saw him and he said, come follow me and I will make you a fisher of men. Mm. Whatever has been going on in your life past, pray that God will show you that you can extract the precious from the worthless mm. and that God has been working in your life ever from, from the beginning. How, how far from the beginning? Well, I don't know. I know Jeremiah. Jeremiah, when God called Jeremiah to his ministry, the ministry of a prophet, an amazing ministry as a prophet, and, and Jeremiah's first response was, well, I, I, I'm too young and I can't speak well. Right. And God said, you know what? He said, I've had my hand on you. I've formed you, in your, before you. I knew you before you came out of your mother's womb. Right. I was forming you in your mother's womb. God has had his hand on your life from when he first knew of you. When did he first know you? Well, your name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life from before the foundations of the earth. So, And he was always with us because he said he would never leave us nor forsake, forsake us. us. Amen. But all ministry is about this. It is a call to serve. Yes. It is a call to serve God. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways you serve God is by serving the people of God. Whatever you've done to the least of my brethren, you've done unto me. Right. And it is a call to reach out as an ambassador, a ministry of reconciliation to the world. Whatever God calls you to. Um, you know, I, I don't know what he's going to call you to, what he has called you to. It can be, it can, like I said, it can be an apostle prophet. It can be a, a pastor. It can be a teacher. It can be a fisherman. It can be... A baker. A baker. <laughs> what is it? A butcher, a baker, baker or a candlestick, candlestick maker. <laughs> but if you're doing it as unto the Lord and doing it to serve God, that will be your ministry, all right? It's all good. Okay, let me let me just back up. I said there's a premise. The premise is every Christian has a ministry from the Lord. Mm -hmm. Every listen to this now. Every ministry is full time. Yes. Because to be a minister doesn't mean you have to stand behind a pulpit or be inside a church building. Mm -hmm. It is about being bringing the knowledge of the presence of Christ Jesus into every place. Okay? That's a full-time job. You don't turn that off. You are always there as the presence of God. You are the presence of God. You bring the presence of God because you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are there to be available, to be used by God, to minister as he desires. All right? Some ministries involve more, more visibility, all right? More church visibility, right. but all ministries are equally visible to the Lord. Right. You've got to understand that. Education, well, sometimes the education, I, I was going to say, sometimes the education can do you more harm than good, but I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say that. Well, wait a minute, I just did. You've got to be really prayerful about this, all right? Because... You know, there's a verse in the Bible that says, knowledge puffs up, mm -hmm. but love edifies, love builds up. A lot of times, I mean, I see people, what their, what their seminary has done for them is to puff them up and make them self-important. Isn't that what happened with the Pharisees? Yes. The yes. scribes, the lawyers, right? There's nothing wrong with getting a diploma. Sheepskin. A sheepskin. Well, you know, the word diploma comes from the Greek word diploma, <laughs> which means fold, it's Greek for folded paper, all right? Okay. And it's a certificate that's issued by an educational institution 
the te- in this, the, the sheepskin, the diploma testifies that the person who's being named there has successfully completed a particular course of study. This is recognizes give any awards, any academic degrees, right? Diplomas are often called sheepskins. They used to be called sheepskins all the time. I mean, our language is changing because originally they were made from sheepskin. sheepskin. Mm-hmm. Paper was difficult to create and extremely delicate back in those olden days, right? right? The entire diploma was written by hand due to the lack of printing presses. Mm-hmm. So later, parchment was used for the diploma at the turn of the 20th century. The diploma usually became bound in leather, right? Mm. Certain schools, it's not used a lot anymore, but certain schools today, universities, still use sheepskins, Mm. right? A school can confer a diploma diploma on students who have successfully completed a course of study designated or designed to prepare them for ministry. But the sheepskin should not be the goal. Should not be the goal. We are think we're sheepskin. We are the sheep. <laughs> yes, we are. Okay. So we, thy people, are the sheep of thy pasture. We'll give thanks to thee forever. To all generations, we will tell of thy praise. Psalm seventy nine thirteen. We are the sheep. All right. Mm-hmm. God does not look. If you think about this in relationship to ministry, God does not look to see if you have the sheepskin. No. Yeah. He doesn't look to see if you have a diploma on the wall that declares that you know stuff. He searches your heart to see if you know him. That's what qualifies you to be used by God to minister. All right. So one of the things now about don't be quick to lay hands on people have to grow. I mean, but maturity is not about time or age. It's a, it's more about commitment than it is about a, a passage of time. Mm-hmm. All right. I mean, I've seen Christians who have been saved for a month who are more committed to the Lord than some of the people I see who have been serving the Lord or have been saved for 25 years. All right. And one of the things that's troubled me over the years is I see new converts who are famous, mm-hmm. whether they're athletes or singers or movie stars or something. They so often get abused by ministries or churches who are trying to cash in on their fame. Okay? That's one of the things. That I mean, that that's happened so often. In the years that I've been ministering, I've seen that over and over and over, where people have literally been, you know, gotten saved, and then they've come in, and they've, they've literally been abused, and they wind up walking away. I mean, that's, that's bad. All right? Because All right. They, they don't have the knowledge yet of what... No, so I mean, so they, anything they say, people are hanging on to every word and believing everything yeah, they say. But somebody gets saved; they're a new convert. They've been yeah. saved a week, and all they of a sudden, they're going to stand in front of twenty thousand people in the mega church and start talking for hours and teaching. Well, shame on that church! Shame on that church! Shame! 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 Okay, let's move along here. All right, First Timothy five twenty three. No longer drink water exclusively, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. Hmm. This is like out of left field a little bit, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it kind of just dropped in. It there. kind of dropped in. Yeah. I, you know, how could that happen? When you write a letter, I mean, you write personal letters. This isn't a business correspondence. No. This is a personal, personal letter. letter. And sometimes you're writing a personal letter and all of a sudden something hits you, you know, your mind. Timothy probably had constant stomach, frequent ailments. That's what it says. Mm-hmm. So while Paul is writing this to him, all of a sudden it you know, comes upon him thinking about this, and he says, take a little wine. Don't just drink water. Now, you got to remember something. Back in those days, the wine was probably safer to drink than the water. Uh, yeah. Okay? <clears throat> Back in the day, they didn't have water treatment plants, and oftentimes the water was not pure and clean. Much like it's getting to be today in a lot of the world, all right? And remember that in earlier in this letter, in the third chapter, in the third verse, Paul told him that overseers must not be addicted to wine. Right. So there's a caution here. Mm-hmm. This is not like, oh, go, go have a party. I'm sorry. It, you know, it says take a little wine for the sake. There have been a lot of studies, and I am not a doctor, but I have seen a lot of studies 
where doctors have said that apparently wine, particularly red wine, used in very limited quantities, it is very good for your heart. It's very good for you, right? right? Mm -hmm. I, when uh, when Timothy wound up being like the pastor at, at Ephesus, you know, Paul led him. When Paul left Timothy, as he, Paul was going to Macedonia, he left Timothy in uh, Ephesus. Okay, and he said to the Ephesians, "Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit." Ephesians five eighteen. So this is not this is not God's permission. To go out and drink as much as you want. You, you got to understand that, right? All right, enough of that. First Timothy 5, 24 and 25. Now, is this going back to 2023? 20, I mean, 20 well, in a sense, I mean, because remember, this is a general same, instruction. Yeah. He's training Timothy to minister, all right? That's exactly what this is. Because his instruction to Timothy is he's training him. And then the instruction is that what he has taught Timothy, Timothy will pass on to others, right? Mm -hmm. So he says, the sins, sins of some men are quite evident, going before them to judgment. For others, the sins follow after. Likewise, also, deeds that are good are quite evident, and those which are otherwise cannot be concealed. You know, it's, it's been troublesome. It's been hurtful. It's been painful during my years of ministry to see how many famous ministers, or, you know, that became famous because of television and radio, all of a sudden had a terrible fall. Right. Now, I'm not saying well, it's a fall from grace, but it's a fall from righteousness, okay? Much too common. Well, much, much too common. So in some lives, it's very, very evident. But some of those, well, it certainly wasn't evident prior to, the, to right. that until it was exposed. Right. But what's been done in the darkness will be brought to light. That's a fact, all right? Mm -hmm. well, you know, let me read the verse that says that in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5. It says, Therefore do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's heart. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. God's going to judge the living in the day, dead. And judgment starts with the household of God. So I believe that we've already been, we're supposed to have been judged mm -hmm. and found righteous. We were judged when Jesus Christ stood before Pontius Pilate That's on a place right. called the pavement. Nothing is hidden from the Lord. And by the way, when he forgives sins, that doesn't always, when he forgives sins, he can forget. That's what it says in, in Isaiah uh, 43, right? But that doesn't mean that all the consequence of sin is removed. Just because God is forgiving sin doesn't mean the consequence is necessarily gone. If, if a young man and woman, unmarried, let's say they're Christians, and they have sexual relations, which is sin, mm -hmm. okay? The Word of God calls that fornication. God can forgive them out of sin. Yes. God is a forgiving God. But if she gets pregnant, that doesn't mean that the baby doesn't show up. No. It doesn't mean that the baby disappears necessarily, right? Mm -hmm. So there's that, there, there are other remains. There's consequence to sin. We need to take that seriously. Mm -hmm. We need to take that seriously, okay? All right, let, let's zip right along because I wanted to move into the next chapter. Okay. Chapter 6, 1 Timothy 6. I'm going to read verses 1 and 2. All who are under the yoke of slaves are to regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and our doctrine will not be spoken against. Those who have believers as their masters must not be disrespectful to them because they are brethren, but must serve them all the more, because those who partake of the benefit are believers and beloved. Teach and preach these principles. You know, it's interesting because we do another Bible study on Friday nights in a, in a group, um, a house group I teach. And Peter talks about the same things. And we talked about that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in, in 1 Peter 2.18, it says, Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, and not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. Right? Because when we're talking about, when they're talking about slavery 2,000 years ago, that kind of equates just to, to working people today. Right? I, I pray that you can see that. 
if you're being misused, abused, mistreated at work by your boss, okay, the great confession is this. God is in control. That's right. God is in control. That is the confession that Jesus Christ made before Pontius Pilate. When Pontius Pilate, nobody has ever been amused like Jesus was at the hands of Pontius Pilate. And Pilate said to Jesus, I mean, this is the man that represents the entire Roman Empire. His word is, I mean, that's what he said to Jesus. He said, don't you understand? I have the power to put you to death. Don't you know who I am? Don't you? Yeah, right. Don't you know who I am? And Jesus said, you would have no power. You would have no authority unless my father gave it to you. He's saying, you think your, your authority comes from Caesar. I'm telling you, your authority. Comes from my he doesn't father. deny that he has it. It comes from my father. Because it was, after all, the father's will to put Jesus to death for our sins. Go read Isaiah 53. Okay? But that is the great confession. God is in control. Amen. And you might want to remember with that, God is love. That's and right. he do love you, all right? Mm -hmm. So often, if your boss is mistreating you, and that's what it's talking here, you're going to look every place in the world for help. Maybe you'll look to a union. Maybe you'll look, you know what? Psalm 121 says this. I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. From, when, from where shall my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. You got a problem? Go to the Lord. If you feel compelled to deal with somebody who's treating you unfairly, somebody who's treating you unjustly, then the Lord will allow you to do that. If you have to deal with them, God will allow you to do it. He's even giving you instruction on how you should do it, okay? Through the Apostle Paul. Here's how, here's how you should do it. If somebody's being mean to you and you got to deal with it, here's how you deal with it. I'm reading from Romans 12, starting in verse 17. Never, N-E-V-E-R, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will keep burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. If you got to take action, there you go. Do good. Do good. <laughs> Somebody hurts you, do good to them. Evil doesn't cancel out evil. Good cancels out evil. Yes. Overcome hate with love. A love that does not take into account a wrong suffered, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13. A love that Christ proclaimed so beautifully, beautifully in the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, Turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, this is Jesus, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. It is a love that Jesus said was for him. This is what you're loving for him. Because he said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. John 14, 15. Well, I didn't get through anywhere near as much as I thought we might. But the fact is, we need to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. We need to just not hear the word. We need to do the word. And we need to understand that we are different than the world. We are peculiar people. We are a peculiar people. We need to think differently. We need to talk differently. We need to act differently. We need to imitate Jesus Christ. Yes. So, Father, I just pray by the power of your spirit that dwells within us, Lord God, that we would indeed 
be like Jesus Christ as we go through this world. Lord, that people would look at us and they would see you. Lord, that we would manifest your presence every place that we go. Lord, that that would be our great concern is to bring your love, to bring your word into the lives of others, Lord God, whatever it turn, turns to cost us. Lord, we've counted the cost and we said we surrender all. So we just praise you and thank you, Father, for your son, Christ Jesus. Well, until next week, join us again. God bless you and goodbye. Thank you. Bye.